Hello, and welcome to Engineering with Rosie Live. Um, in today's live stream, we're going to be talking about concentrated solar power, which was the topic of my latest video last week. Um, we have an amazing guest, Keith Lovegrove. Hi, Keith. Um, we'll introduce him properly. Morning, Rosie. Um, yeah, so we'll introduce Keith properly in a second. But first of all, everyone who's watching, can you tell me um, where you're calling in from? If you saw the video, you liked it, didn't like it. And if you've got questions uh, for Keith then um, or me, then, yeah, get started writing those in the comments. Um, so I'm going to start of the sponsor, start with thanking the sponsor of these live streams, which is WeatherGuard Lightning Tape. Um, sorry, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech, WeatherGuard Make Strike Tape, which is a retrofitable lightning protection system for things that go fast, like wind turbine blades and aircraft. Um, these live streams wouldn't happen without their support. So it's a big, huge thanks to them. And as always, I need to thank the whole Engineering with Rosie um, Patreon team who support every video that I make. And they also have had the opportunity to pre-submit some questions for this live stream. So um, if you would like to join us, then you can find the link in the description. So hi, Keith. Keith is actually, Keith was my, um, I know him from, university, my undergraduate engineering degree. Um, you taught me thermodynamics. I don't know, maybe there were some other topics as well, but you know, I still I st still know thermodynamics, so you must have Lovely. done it well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so that was about 20 years ago or more. Oh, don't know? tell them that, um, Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel old as well. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and so I think you were working on concentrated solar thermal even then. Um, now you're the managing director, managing director of ITP Thermal. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about, um, yeah, your, what you've had to do with um, CSP? And yeah, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> oh, thanks, Rosie. Well, back in the day when I was at the uni with yourself and others, um, I was running the solar thermal group there and. Uh, we had a long history of developing solar concentrators sort of culminating in the um, 500 square meter big dish that's still on the ANU campus at the moment and a lovely thing that is too. Um, since then I've moved out into the private sector and as you said uh, running a little thing called ITP Thermal. It's part of a wider group, uh, the ITP energized group of companies which uh, offer consultancy and engineering across all renewable energies, um, activities in the UK, India and Australia. Um, and yeah, that keeps us off the streets. Uh, ITB Thermal specialises <laughs> indeed in solar thermal, uh, but also a lot of work on hydrogen, hydrogen storage and ammonia and things like that. Yeah, cool. I should get you back for a, a hydrogen storage um, one at some point. That's definitely... Yep. On my on my list of uh, of topics, one of the better uses of hydrogen, in my opinion. Um, okay, so basically, what we're going to do today is I've been through the YouTube comments and kind of collated themes. Um, and like I said, I've got some questions from Patreon community. Um, so and yeah, of course, everyone watching live, we will be um, well. I'll be monitoring the comments and. Um, and asking those two, but I need to start off first of all with a correction, which um, yeah, a big thanks to you, Keith, for all your help making this video. And it was really good to, you know, be able to um, comment on, yeah, with your insider's perspective. But I did make a mistake where I um, misinterpreted one of the corrections that you gave me and ended up with a mistake in the video, which somebody on YouTube also um, picked up which was about the my timeline um so i had you know talked about a solar one tower 10 megawatts and oh you can you can tell me what what really happened i kind of made it sound like it was a 10 megawatt project that um eventually turned into a 350 megawatt project um in the us in the 80s but um can you correct me on, on what really happened yeah i think um whoever picked you up on it obviously knew a bit of the history there. So there were two parallel uh, initiatives going on, if you like. The the solar one that became solar two was an experimental or pilot tower system that the DOE funded. So that happened at around that time on your timeline. Um, but at the same time, uh, there was, uh, I think in the end, nine separate 
trough-based power plants that were actually built as commercially operating power plants. Um, and they sort of came through in a sequence from the early 80s. And the last one, I think, was built in 89 or 90. Um, so they, they were fully commercial plants using the trough design. And they, they've they actually, I, I believe they've retired now um, after exceeding over over 30 years of continuous operation. So they, they actually exceeded their economic design life um, and, and went very well indeed. So, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks for that. I was just spending all that time trying to bring up the, the right screen on my um, video. But, uh, oh, no, that's the wrong one as well. I'm sharing the wrong screen. Okay. I will, I will figure this out. But um, <laughs> that raises to Very me. Very good slide there, by the way. The, one of the main points. That, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm having, having a little technical problem as I... Uh, common viewers will know, recognize that that's what happens every single time I do one of these. So you shouldn't be surprised. Um, okay. But I think that ties in well then to one of the common themes um, that people were asking about, um, which is specific pro projects in the past that have had problems. A lot of people said things like, you know, we've tried this before, it didn't work, it's going nowhere, which was, I would say that was my kind of like gut feeling as well before I started um, researching it more. I did sort of feel like, you know, isn't that old news? Um, if, if that was going to work, it would have already. Um, and then so specifically, for example, John from the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team asks, um, he said, it's a great video. Thanks, John. Uh, it would be great to have Keith discuss what is up with Ivanpah. Um, so that's one project. And then um, on YouTube, people said, um, yeah, dismayed at the Port Augusta plant not getting up after years of um, support. Some stories about the Nevada plant, lots of gas support, et cetera, were a worry. Um, yeah, Gemma or Gemma Solar Spain seems to be a success. What are some of the other ones? Crescent Dunes was one that came up a lot. It's at idle for many years due to numerous factors. Um, yeah, could you address the problems that shut down the Nevada CSP? Um, had high hopes for Crescent Dunes, but um, it was, yeah, it was supposed to be a flagship for molten salt energy storage, plagued with problems, economic <laughs> failure, bankruptcy, offline for two years. <laughs> um, yeah, so pick out of those which ones oh, no. that you want. But it's a disaster. <laughs> I think we'll give up. Yeah, it's a, it's a disaster. I mean, no. I did see a lot more comments like that than ones like, oh, I have a CSP plant near me and it's going swimmingly. Right. Um, so, yeah. Well, Can you address that? I guess... Let, let's ground it back on the previous comment about those those um, SEGS plants in California, the 350 megawatts. They, they ran continuously for over 30 years. And in fact, year by year, they, they debugged them and improved them and their output actually crept up over those years. Um, so that, that's a sort of background of really good performance that nobody's ever heard of and you hardly ever see it and they never made it into the news and so on. And... As, as you sort of illustrated pretty well in your video, Rosie, there is a trend now to move from the, the trough plants, which are the absolutely proven uh, and dominant uh, part of CSP technology. There's a move towards these tower plants now, which offer higher temperatures, so they're higher efficiency and they store more energy in the thermal storage because they heat it hotter. So, so they they are sort of perceived to have an a performance advantage at the moment. Now, mm -hmm. the comments that you got, uh, there, there were a lot of comments, I think, about uh, Nevada and Crescent Dunes. Well, first of all, they're one and the same thing. There is in Nevada at Crescent Dunes, which is a place there is the, um, um, the, the tower plant there that was developed by a company called Solar Reserve in the first instance. Um, and Solar Reserve as a company, oh, there it is, are no longer with us. So this, this is not without its difficulties, these kind of new technologies. Um, the, the current state of this Crescent Dunes plant, um, I believe it's now owned by the construction company 
uh, Cobra, Cobra Group from Spain, who were part of building it in the first place. And I do believe it's it's running now. Um, they've been working through some difficulties. Fun the fundamental difficulty they came up with was that the hot the hot tank that stored the hot salt developed a leak, and and that was a bit unexpected because there'd been a, a long history of hot salt tanks in plants in Spain, but maybe it was because this took the salt to a slightly higher temperature, and so the the thermal stresses were a bit more than had been experienced before. So that that was it. It's like not a rocket science problem. It was a leaky tank. Um, now, with it, with all new industries, there's like wheels within wheels. And you can say, well, why did Solar Reserve as a development company fail? Um, that's a really complicated story. But you can find some of the explanation there in that they were totally diddled by the South African government in that they won a project on a competitive tender over there and South Africa had a change of government that did some very strange things, not to mention which completely undermined their business case. And I think if you had to point at one reason for their failure as a company, it's probably that. So it's complicated, um, but, you know, all new technologies, when you try out a new version of it, it would be very odd indeed if you didn't find some sort of technical challenges to begin with. But since this Crescent Dunes one was built, and, and as the, um, the comment noted, that was like a flagship for sort of first of a kind of a very large salt tower. Um, there's been over half a dozen more completed in the world and of most recently quite a lot of them built in China. So they're, they're pushing ahead, you know. It's, one one's one tank leak is not the end of an industry. Yeah, and um, do you have some e examples of ones that have been running for a really long time? Because I mean, yeah, they started in the eighties, um, and I think you yeah. mentioned to me that some of them have had a longer lifetime than was expected at the start of the the project. So I guess for balance, right. we should talk about that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So the trough plants have just they just keep keep on on giving. They've they've the oldest ones had a excess of 30 years working life worked brilliantly all that time and there's many many more trough plants that are just running every single day in spain and in the us and now in china and morocco and other places um so they just keep getting runs on the board if you go back to the the tower the salt tower story that very first pilot that you talked about on your timeline, the 10 megawatt plant, the solar one plant yeah. in the US, that was the first sort of experimental pilot system of the salt tower idea. Um, that was followed by a plant in Spain called Hemisolar. And I think one of your comment, uh, one of your people's comments referred to Hemisolar. So Hemisolar is a 20 megawatt electrical molten salt tower system. And that's been running, ooh, I think since the mid '90s, if I'm not mistaken. So that's that's really been going quite well for quite a number of years. Not to say that they wouldn't have had some things to work through as they went through it, but it's it's definitely got runs on the board. And then since then, there's some more of the bigger ones being built, and there's a very big one just being commissioned now in the United Arab Emirates, for example, 100 megawatt tower. It's part of a 700 megawatt total system being built. All concentrated solar power. Um, yes, indeed. Um, but but actually built uh, in a hybridised way with very large PV farms. Um, okay. In actual fact, if you build the whole thing together as a combination, you you can get the best of the best of all worlds, basically. Yeah. Right. I did notice that and um, I just brought up a Renew Economy article on that one. My there you go. It's really yep. slow, so it's not, not moving well. But That's the one. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Oh, hold on. That one, this is a 2013 article, um, but there's a... Oh, okay. Wrong one. There's a... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they got the date wrong on that one. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, uh, no, that looks one. like the one. Yes. So it's that 100 nice. megawatt central tower is part of you can you can actually see in the background the trough plants that are there is also oh locally. okay oh. yeah so in the same site you've got trough plants you've got tower plant and you've got pv plants all sort of 
run and operate it as an integrated system. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's let's move on to another topic. Um, just trying to think what what order. Let's start with where should we locate concentrated solar power? Um, because obviously you can't just put it <laughs> anywhere. Um, and then that will, le will lead us on to some of the other questions that people had. Yep. Uh, well, where to where to put it? Um, well. In a sunny place, how about that? <laughs> I mean, we're not going to put it in southwest Tasmania. Um, you know, effectively, there we go, a map of direct beam solar DNI, direct normal irradiation. It, it's the, uh, the, the CSV plants work with mirrors, so they, they need clear sunlight. They can't work in part, part, part cloud. Um, so wherever it's really sunny, which is basically the deserts of the world, is going to be really good for it. Um, but if you look at the map of Australia there, you would say that, that kind of mauve area would tell you to, um, uh, you know, do it way out in the middle of a desert uh, somewhere west of yeah. Alice Springs. Well, sure, and that would be the best performance. Everyone lives here. <laughs> that exactly so. So so what that says to you is that there will be an optimum location. Now, viewers might or might not know that the national electricity market in Australia is the electricity system that serves the eastern states only. It doesn't connect over to the west. So it's, it's about servicing all the population centres right around the south and east coast, and it extends inland a certain way sort of you know right into the middle of New South Wales and Queensland but not all the way um, to their edges so if you're thinking about a CSP plant to service that network it the optimum place is going to be somewhere as far inland as you can get where there is or will be a good transmission line connection to the load centers so it, it's kind of a trade-off and I mean, you know, one of the things that's happening in Australia at the moment is as we go through the energy transition, uh, there's, there's an, a realisation that we do have to spend a lot more on transmission connections to connect up what's been called our renewable energy zones. So picking areas that are good for renewable energy, be that PV, wind or CSP, and making sure there's strong con strong transmission connections to those. So that's that's the kind of trade-off that's happening, and that would apply in any country, really. Um, mm. at, while you've got that I'd map probably, up there. Very... I'll just add in that um, pumped hydro would probably be the other one that I would I would put on to, you know, um, technologies that you're going to look at when you're going to figure out where transmission is going to go. And with the big pumped hydro that um, we're adding in Australia, Snowy Hydro 2.0, the transmission is <laughs> probably the biggest biggest argument that keeps on happening about, you know, um, who's going to pay for it? Is the, you know, environmental impact of it worth it? And all that sort of thing. Yes. So I don't think that there is an energy source that can, um, you know, avoid the issue of, of transmission. Um, yeah, I mean, even back in the day, obviously, where you, you put a coal power plant near a big, coal mine um and that wasn't where people live so you had to build out that transmission people maybe think that it's not an issue for traditional power plants but it's just because that issue was solved you know many decades ago no that's absolutely right um and the fact that we have a big transmission network is an important and, and good and useful thing because it actually helps to give us a geographic spread of where the the, particularly the solar generation is, whether it's PV or CSP, just by spreading it all the way from North Queensland down to South Australia means that the probability that it's sunny somewhere is, is, is very, very much higher than if you, you somehow, you know, tried to make every house a self-sustaining thing, which is technically possible, but way, way, way more expensive. Yeah, you'd want to build a second house full of batteries to, <laughs> to make that work with any kind of um, reliability, I think. Um, well, we've got this map. Would you mind telling me where, where are the you know, countries that are going hard on CSP at the moment? Like what sort of colours are we looking at to make this attractive? Right. Well, anywhere you don't need from, the pink, right? No, anywhere from dark orange upwards works well. Okay. So it's fairly obvious. Um, just over on the left there, you can see southwestern United States, California, and so on. So that's where all of their CSP is. 
Um, you can see Spain up there. Spain on that map, it doesn't look that brilliant, but Spain has done an awful lot in CSP. Uh, then down in South Africa, there's quite a lot of development. Then North Africa, particularly Morocco, uh, and then scattered around the Middle East. You can see that's a good site. Um, mm. Interesting one to look at is if you can visualize where China is on that map, the, the very notable blue blob is, of course, uh, the eastern part of China where everyone lives, and they seem to have the distinction of the lowest DNI on that map whatsoever. <laughs> but if you go to the west of China, what you see is that you pick up some really good resources there. And in fact, it's good for solar, good for wind, uh, good for CSP. That's where they're building lots of everything. Um, so they're actually literally trying to power the east of the country using power generation in the west, and they're building a lot of high voltage DC transmission to do that. So that's a very interesting thing. Um, mm. Last one to mention, I suppose, is Chile. You can see uh, in South America there that mauve portion, which is the Atacama Desert that actually has the distinction of being the highest DNI spot on the planet. And mm. so far, there's one large plant there. Um, and probably there'll be more in the future. Hmm. I should go there. <laughs> it's good, a good <laughs> reason to go there. The, you know, also, that's the lithium right. mines there would be interesting. Yes, visit that's right. Panel. Yeah, interesting. Yes. Can you tell me, is this blue patch, is that related to smog at all? Is that part of the, the problem or it's just naturally low? Because, you know, like what is it? So uh, low as, um, what's this over here, that, like Scotland and <laughs> um, just yes. seems unusual? I I suspect... I mean, I'm not one to comment, but I imagine, I mean, e everything in the air that stops DNI hitting the ground. So, yes, mm. I imagine there is a certain amount of pollution involved in that. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So let's then um, go to a, a viewer question. So um, we'll start with this one from, there's a few from Gordon Bishop. Uh, so you mentioned that China's putting them, you know, in the West as good wind and good solar. Um, Grodin raises the point that mirrors would really catch the wind and um, potentially break, or does the plant need to go idle as the mirrors are put into a safe position? <laughs> is that is that a, a factor that has to be um, um, designed for? Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Um, and I, I'll go to the last part of the question, and, and it was do the mirrors have to be put in a stow position to be safe in strong winds? And the answer is absolutely yes, that's how they're designed. Um, if you think about it, you know, in a common sense way, the chances of having really strong, clear sunlight and really strong winds at the same time, that kind of doesn't happen. Um, so every place you build them will be subject to high winds at times. So they are designed to park in a way that reduces wind resistance and you design them for that. So, um, you know, you built a structure. M mainly designing the structures is about designing for wind loads. That's largely what the mechanical design is all about. Um, it's interesting, let's say, when you go to the Australian map there and you look at all that Mo stuff and it, it goes all the way to the northwest coast. Well, if you built them on the coast, they'd be subject to cyclones and things. And you say, well, that's probably, well, let, let me say, almost certainly something you wouldn't do um, however, you know, uh, we did recently look into that idea and it, if you had to, if you decided, I wish to design one to work in a cyclone prone area, it might increase the cost by 30 or 40%. So if you had a really good reason to do it, you still could. Hmm. Okay. Um, let's move on to one um, which is also raised by that same questioner, Gordon, but also a lot on YouTube water source um, for just steam or cooling, if not using air cooled condenser. And a lot of people in YouTube yeah, yeah. No, raised the point that yep. all the really good locations for CSP are in the desert and deserts aren't known for having, you know, a lot of surplus water no, available. That's right. Yeah. But that the comment you just showed kind of answered the question already because it mentioned the concept of dry cooling. So let, let's just explore the water use for a moment. Um, the first of all, 
if you think about the steam, these things run on steam turbines. So you think about the water that's in the steam turbine turning into steam going through the turbine. That's ultra pure water that gets reused. It doesn't leave the system. So, you know, a tiny bit of topping up, that's negligible amount of water use. You could bring it in on a truck if you needed to. So put that one aside. That doesn't really count. There's this idea of cooling. Cooling is the big issue. Now, a lot of thermal power plants, meaning any, any power plant like a coal plant that uses a steam turbine, you have to condense the steam at the end. So you need cooling. And the in a, one of the easier ways to do it, if you have a lot of water, because you're near a river or something and you just have a lot of water, is an evaporative cooling tower. And people driving around Australia looking at our coal-fired power stations, they'll recognise the cooling towers. They, what they're doing is they're just spraying water down and cooling a condenser and a lot of evaporated water is going up that big chimney that you see. So that's great if you've got a lot of water and it's for free. But this idea of an air-cooled condenser is perfectly viable and a lot of the plants that are being built in deserts now use it. Because what you do is you you don't do the evaporative cooling tower. You just have a thing that's like a giant car radiator with a fan and you cool it down just by blowing air over it. So it doesn't use any water at all. And the difference... Um, so what, what are you left with then? You still use a bit of water in these plants, again, if it's available, to wash the mirrors from time to time. Um, you do that with a PV farm as well. You wash the panels from time to time if they're getting dust on. Um, but it's if you've got rid of the cooling, you've got rid of 90% of the water use by using air-cooled condensers. So that, that seems to be all right. I mute myself while I was drinking. <laughs> right. Okay. So <laughs> there is way to do it. It seems, um, you know, like uh, temperatures get up to like 50 degrees close to 50 degrees and some of these places can you really cool by blowing 50 degree air across a radiator um i, I guess you can but you, it seems you, like you can <laughs> that's right <laughs> um, i mean it's a very good point um the 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 turbine will be less efficient during the middle of the day than it is at night um but you know going back to the argument of why are people moving to towers rather than troughs well the towers heat things up to close to 600 degrees C. So the efficiency of a cycle is the, you know, the difference between the high temperature and the bottom temperature. It's old thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. um, so the higher you make the higher temperature, the less it matters so much if you lose a bit at the low temperature. Um, but one, one of the things to keep in mind with CSP that you've articulated so well in your video is that its real advantage is that it's storing the energy so that it can run, the power system can run all night. In fact, there'll be an increasing tendency to only run these things at night. So in which case, the midday air temperature isn't really the point. And in actual fact, in desert environments, the, the nighttime air temperature can get really surprisingly low, but very low at times, mm. especially these high altitude deficits. Um, so um, yeah, so, so not, a, not a huge issue is the answer. Yeah. Okay. Good. And uh, thanks for tying it back into the thermodynamics that I've uh, <laughs> obviously forgotten. I remember doing um, exams, and I, uh, I had my my brother went through ANU engineering six years before me, so I mostly just borrowed his textbooks. And so I had his old thermodynamics textbook and there'd been several editions come out in between. And I remember doing this one exam question where you got to like look up a lot of things in tables when you're doing thermodynamics. And I, I ended up in this loop. I like, was looking up something to find the value to look up in the next table to look up in the next table. And half an hour later, ended up back at the place where I started and realized that my six-year-old textbook didn't have the the table that I needed and I just wasted oh, no. a good chunk of my time. Yeah, so that was that's my main enduring memory from the oh, well. dynamics and also that you can't create or destroy energy. So, you know, that's a, that's an important one to, yes. to carry as well. No, you're not allowed to do that. No. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> Although every time that I mention that in a video, I get um, swamped with people who find my email address and say, oh, I loved your video on thermodynamics. And I uh, assume you would love to invest in my technology that beats oh, the laws no. of thermodynamics. <laughs> like, ah, no. Um, you, you, really, you really got the message of the video that I was trying to convey. <laughs> Good to know that. Uh, actually, the interestingly, the the I think there's less and less of people trying to promote perpetual motion machines these days and free energy. But but what what they have moved on to in a way is this idea that oh someone's going to invent an energy system that's just so cheap that it'll be free, right? Even mm. if it doesn't violate the laws of thermodynamics. But I, I reckon. You know, there's probably another law there that says there's no free lunches. Sorry, you know, <laughs> we can make yeah. things cheaper, but we're never going to make them free. <laughs> no, and I should do a video on that as well because, um, you know, at some point you get down to the main cost being, you know, raw materials and balance of plant and all that sort of yep. stuff is, you know, it's yeah. never going to be pipes are never going to be free. We've, you know, put in enough <laughs> enough of them that they would be by now if they were ever going to get that way. Um, it's never going to be free to, you know, extract the minerals out of the ground. Anyway, I think we digress a little bit. Um while we're talking, um, uh, yeah, what we were talking about before, I think leads on to one of the other main threads of um, comments or criticisms that people made. Sometimes criticism, sometimes a question. People want to know about their energy density and the land use. Um, so somebody asked, what's the comparative power generation per square meter for CSP versus PV? So um, I guess you can maybe you've got a a qualitative answer for that. Um, and let me just read another one before you answer that. So um, one of the main criticisms is the amount of land that needs to be cleared. Um, yeah, so how how much land does it take up and would it be feasible to build the heliostats on tall supports and scaffoldings to have minimal disturbance to the area beneath? Some people mentioned putting it on, on lakes um and right. i can just imagine you know we've got our cities and then we've got you know uh csp just floating floating above over the top um but maybe we'll just start with the simple ones how much time does it use and how does that compare to other you know similar storage or yeah, energy right. generation so quality well, there you go there's a good one brought, um, brought this up <laughs> ahead of time yep. um no that's a perfect illustration so a qualitative answer is I'm not super familiar with the PV land area usage, but I think these things are all pretty comparable if you measure them as how, ma how much land have you used per amount of energy that you've generated. Um, because you know, of often people might say how many hectares per megawatt, um, mm. but that's a little bit confusing because if you've got a system with uh, you know 15 hours of storage that can run almost 24 hours a day, then the land area it needs is going to be a lot more than a system that only runs six hours a day per megawatt. So it's the, it's the area per collected energy that, that matters. Um, the, the tower system that you're showing there, the, the tower systems actually use a bit more land than the trough systems and the linear Fresnel systems use the least land of all. Um, but do, does that matter? Uh, I mean, last time I looked in Australia, short, shortage of land in arid areas wasn't really our problem. I mean, because you're putting these things in pretty arid areas, the world actually has heaps of land. I mean, we can do we could do all the world's energy from Australia with a you know a, a relatively tiny spot um, in our arid areas. Um, it is nonetheless changing the land use. Um, I think an ideal outcome with solar farms, be they PV or um, CSP, is that you do it in a way <clears throat> that you're doing it in a, gra a grazing area, right? Sheep or cattle, and you, you set it up in a way that they can carry on grazing in between the collectors because they absolutely can. Um, the, some of the, the trough plants, um, the, the way they were built initially is that they did actually clear the land and absolutely level it before they started construction. So I suppose that's pretty intrusive. These heliostat fields on tower plants are probably the least intrusive. And the Ivanpah project in the US that someone mentioned earlier, 
that's actually notable notable for the effort they went to to put the heliostats into the land without disturbing the land. So they didn't clear it whatsoever because it was actually important habitat for a tortoise, I think. So they, they just basically planted the piles into the land without disturbing the vegetation. So you can absolutely do that. You can absolutely combine it with grazing and we've got plenty of land in any case. Yeah, so no one's talking about <laughs> like um, clearing cropland and um, putting this in instead or, you know, going and clearing a native forest to, to put this in. I mean, if there's enough water for things to grow, then there's probably too much cloud <clears> for <throat> it to be a really effective um, place for CSP. Is that roughly right? Yeah, I think that's roughly right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, with all things, everything that we do in the energy transition, um, it's no excuse to trash other environmental values. So, you know, we should just simply say as a community, no, we're not going to clear sensitive areas for these things. I mean, it's probably a bigger issue with wind turbines, actually. Uh, the yeah, ones there's a few controversial ones to be. at the moment. That's um, right. In Australia, a few wind farms, yeah. so would like exactly. to make a video on that. Yeah, but yeah. It's yeah. always super hard to form a like good opinion on those projects without knowing the specifics of the of the project, I, I think. But definitely That's agree right. that as a as yeah. a rule, there's enough um, places to put we've got, you know, way more land than we need to get all our energy from renewables. So why would you start off with, you know, bothering endangered was it turtles? Yep. Tortoises? Um, yeah, or orange bellied parrots or or whatever it is. Um, so that's a good segue into another topic that was raised a lot and one that gets raised no matter what uh, I, technology I talk about, people ask about birds. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bird lover. I have binoculars and I, <laughs> I go out specifically looking, looking for birds. I mean, Australia is a really good place to um, go bird watching. So I'm pleased that everybody is so interested in the birds, but I have noticed that they're only interested in birds that are killed by renewable energy and not interested in birds that are <laughs> killed by yeah. feral cats, cars, buildings, which is the, you know, the, the vast majority. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've got a couple of, of questions. One from Patreon first, Kevin from Patreon asks, are there any plans to address the wildlife hazards that tower CSPs pose, especially the birds? They provide a significantly larger and more lethal kill zone versus wind. Um, and someone on YouTube says, I happened to see the test plant in Spain with a bird watching group and they had concern about the impact of birds. Are you aware of any studies on this topic? Um, well, yeah, to the last question, uh, there has been a very interesting study from Sandia National Labs in the US on it because it, it got raised up as an issue um, where people are saying anecdotally, oh, this these things are killing a lot of birds. Particularly, it was the tower plants that were accused of doing this. Because, of course, if, you, if you're if you a bird or a person or anything else and you go into that sharp focus there, uh, you'll be burnt to a crisp. It won't happen on a trough plant because it's not intense enough, but will happen on a tower plant. Um, but what, what was found, actually, when they looked into it carefully is that um, people had been watching the focus and seeing the occasional, oh, there we go, Cliff Ho, there, that's exactly the study I was thinking of, seeing the occasional flash and puff of smoke. Um, but what, what was found is that 90% um, of them were s small insects, right? And, and that's not to say that crisping small insects is to be dismissed. But, you know, one of the things that Sandia did in that, that study that you're showing there is that they actually... Uh, I think they dropped chicken carcasses through the focus to show that there's no way a bird can be burnt to ash in as, in as much as that if there was a bird kill, you would find the corpse and you can count it in the same way as you might do at a wind farm. So you can't vanish them. So if, if you see a flash and it vanishes, it's a little tiny insect, not... So wait, um, are you saying that the villain in The Man with the Golden Gun, his um, solar <laughs> death ray, was not physically accurate? <laughs> well, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Shock. Uh, you, you can do a lot of damage with concentrated solar radiation, but yes, you, it, it doesn't come out as a death ray. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so, so again, you know, it goes back to the land area thing. I mean, it behoves us to think carefully where we cite these things and not put them where vulnerable species are going to be impacted. Um, but, you know, I think the evidence is that the, the, the impact of these things is probably less than most other things that human and society does. Yeah, and I um, I think I saw somewhere, now I can't find it, I had it on my phone, but um, maybe it was in that study or another one that most of the bird deaths were from collision with the, the mirrors rather than being f fried or um, atomized by the, by the death ray. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's something to keep thinking about and, as you say, with those sorts of collision things, I mean, you know, probably bird scaring devices particularly in places where they you know that might be needed that's the sort of thing yeah yeah okay so we've got a comment from solex x mobiles like both birds are killed by pollution and hit by cars than any solar um yeah but birds um sorry cats cars and buildings is the way that i normally describe yeah. it I definitely yeah so i think I mean, you know all of these things should be thought about thought about carefully but they they shouldn't be turned into urban myths that somehow are used to say, oh, no, this technology won't work. You know, every technology yeah. needs to think about its environmental impact. Yeah, it's funny because um, so that same comment that says bird mortality is dumb trolling and <laughs> it's it's hard because I am I am legitimately I am such a bird lover. Um so I find it hard to, you know, get to the point where I'm just like rolling my eyes and saying, you know, like who cares about the the birds? But I do talk about it a lot, a lot more than um, you should have to. I think you got to put things in perspective. And the the rule of thumb that I always use when talking about birds is, you know, if if a group claims to care about birds but they're only protesting wind farms or you know CSP and not addressing cats, cars, or, or buildings, you know, that kill many thousands of times more birds than they're not pro-bird, they're, they're anti-renewable no. energy. So I think... Yep, yep. No, it's not, a, it's not really an issue. Mm. Yeah. And we've got some good um, comments from um, Gordon Bishop in the, yeah, in the comment section. He's obviously spent some time, quite some time working in um, CSP and has some good anecdotes, one about a, a swan Oh, no, goose thinking that it was landing on a lake instead of a mirror that died, but also that um, he killed two birds and two rabbits in two years in the way to work in the car. <laughs> and that's what I um, saw when I was right. researching. Okay, birds next topic. Being next by, topic, Rosie. <laughs> by wind <farm. laughs> All right, we're, we're sick of sick of talking about birds. That's fair enough. Um, okay, so one that got raised. Uh, a lot as well was possibility to convert a uh, coal steam turbine to CSP. So, you know, uh, a lot of coal power plants are going to close down. Um, oh, we can get rid of that study. A lot of coal power plants are set to close down um, while there's, you know, nothing wrong with the, the, the plants, just not economic mm -hmm. anymore. Um, everybody wants to think of new things to do with coal power plants. And I have covered lots of um, technologies on my, my show before about that. Could you do it? Could you can retrofit, convert to CSP, or would it just be um, the technically wrong possibly place? yes? Um, in Australia, in in the east coast, um, most of our coal plants are near the coast, so they're not in very good CSP solar locations. Um, a couple of the ones up in Queensland would be good candidates in the sense, like. Kogan Creek, for example, there's a power station there in a very good solar location. So think about that. Um, but would you though? Um, there's there's always the issue of, our, I mean, one of the big issues in Australia is our coal plants are progressively retiring. They're all due to retire by about 2030, and that's because they're getting to the end of their working life. So, would retrofitting them make sense? Um, shouldn't shouldn't rule it out because you could um but they're reaching their end of their life anyway so it kind of have to be rebuilt as you were doing it um another thing to think about is that the 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 approach to um coal plants has been we've called them base load generators they're very big steam turbines and they 
They're really designed to run 24 hours a day and they don't like to speed up and slow down very much and they don't start up very quickly. Whereas the steam turbines that people are now adopting for CSP plants, they've been specifically designed for fast starts and ramping up and ramping down. And so th that's a really valuable feature because what, what we want from our CSP plants is we want this dispatchable behaviour. We, we want the ability to fill in the gaps. You know, the wind's dropped off, the wind, wind farms have dropped their output, the CSP plant ramps up quickly to fill the gap. We, we want that kind of behaviour. That's one of the real values it brings. So if you retrofitted a coal plant, you might not get that. Um, having said that, there's a very interesting um, uh, line of investigation going on in Europe in the moment, in Germany in particular, where they're thinking of keeping, you know, retrofitting the coal plants and putting in these big tanks of hot salt storage, um, but heating those tanks with electricity. So you've got a thermal power plant with all of the sort of features that brings of um, you know, synchronous generators and inertia and, and system strength and all the rest of it. Um, and you've stored energy because the, the salt storage is really cost-effective way of storing energy. Um, on the other hand, putting it in electrically is a rather inefficient round trip kind of thing. So, so it's definitely on the agenda, Rosie, um, but it, it's not some kind of silver bullet to, to solving all problems, that's for sure. Yeah, okay. That um, is another topic that uh, I had on the list was using CSP as thermal storage that can take electricity, you know, and heat the, the salt like that. In So instead of just, you know, you mentioned that CSP can provide you know, base, base load or um, it, it can provide round the clock um, electricity if you wanted it to, um, whether you would or not, that's another question um, because as we get more and more solar PV in the system, you know, there's not usually yep. any need to add mm. more electricity to the grid in the middle of a sunny day. Um, so could you size the storage larger and then um, take, you know, some of that really cheap solar electricity in the middle of the day and use that to heat up um, the, the thermal storage? Would it make sense to, you know, kind of combine it in that way and make it more of a battery and less of just purely, um, right. you know, yeah, no. Okay, Leah, yeah, let's explore that a bit. It's a really important point. First of all, the the salt tanks in those CSP plants actually do have electric heaters in. They're there as an ultimate backup in case the whole system is shut down for an extended period or something. So, so they, they do exist. So you can put electric heaters in those tanks. You could put bigger electric heaters in the tanks. If you if you if you thought about it as a electrically heated tank that then made electricity from a steam turbine, the problem with that is that it's a low round trip efficiency. You at best you'll get about forty percent of the electricity you put in back again. But as you said, if if you're facing a situation where there's actually curtailment of the PV or the wind because it's literally in excess, then it it's it's free in that sense. I mean, there in the wholesale market in Australia, there are consistent times, particularly in South Australia, where the wholesale price is negative. They'll actually pay you to take electricity away. So in those circumstances, if you've got a CSP plant, you might as well take that extra input with an electric heater for sure. But then you get to this discussion of, oh, well, should we get rid of the mirrors and we'll just charge it electrically? And the answer to that is, the mirrors are way more efficient at getting heat into the tank. And as things currently stand, the, the cost of energy into the tank is still a lot cheaper using a mirror field than it is using a PV field and electric heaters. So, I, I, and, I, and if you think about it, if you think of the sophistication and complexity of a PV panel versus it's just a mirror and the mirror is 90% reflective, you know, the mirror is a pretty easy way to shift energy around. So that it should it should continue to prevail as the cheaper thing in that way. Yeah. Okay. That's um that's a good point. That's definitely something that that gets raised a lot and sounds like um, in theory at least a, a good idea. So we're nearly out of time. Um, 
I don't know if there's something, Keith, that you hear a lot that hasn't been asked here that you'd like to answer, or if not, then I'll I'll give you one one final one before we wrap up. Oh, look, I, I think just to emphasise the message of your video, Rosie, that, um, uh, you know, I, I think the time has come for this. The world is 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 trying to decarbonise itself. Australia has embraced that journey. We're going to do it. We're going to do it in your lifetime, if not mine. <laughs> and, <laughs> I don't think there's so much um, between us. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, and and in a sense, the the wind farms and the PV farms have been the low hanging fruit. I mean, great, they get us the cheaper renewable energy, but only when it's available. So we we simply have to start that journey of saying no, we're going a hundred percent. So we need the things with the long duration storage, and and we're going to need them because the coal's retiring. We know the coal's retiring, but we have to start building them now to get ready for the coal's retirements. And that that is the big issue in Australia. And it's actually the big issue everywhere in the world is how to get people to get ready for the transition rather than sort of wait for a brick wall to crash into. Yeah, I think it's that point. Like until now in Australia, at least, we've done really well at um, <clears throat> excuse me, allowing the the market to kind of you know run in terms of wind and solar are cheaper than other kinds of electricity. So lots is getting rolled out without any need for government support. But um, long duration storage is not going to be like that unless we you know specifically change the market to make it that way or come up with something else because. Yeah, That's by the right. time that you know that you need <clears throat> long duration storage, you, you need yep. it. You you can't start building it when the lights go out. Um, exactly. Then, you know, exactly. Just wait three years yeah. for them to come and back on again, or, or whatever there is, longer. If it, uh, you know, in the Australian duration. context, there is light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, because what's on the table at the moment is the concept of a capacity investment scheme, which would be a a new market mechanism that would reward the presence of things that had this firm capacity, like the things that you could always rely on, you would give them a certificate and the certificate would have value in the marketplace. So if we can design that properly, I think that's actually a really good outcome. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I just really quickly ask you to comment on, so we need long duration storage. Um, where do you see, or how do you see CSP competing against other emerging technologies? So, I mean, I won't call pumped hydro an emerging technology, um, but I mm. guess it, you know, it's, it's emerging more than it has been in the past, but like flow batteries, I don't know, any um, compressed air, hydrogen, uh, gravity, <laughs> energy storage, and any <laughs> there's any number of crazy ideas. Thermal storage, a lot yeah. of you know, I've covered a lot of thermal technologies on on the channel. Look, where does look, it I fit say, in? Is it a, a winner takes all type situation, <laughs> or do you see a mix? I think I see a mix. I, I think if you look at the pumped hydro and the CSP, they're the ones who are technically mature in this long duration space. And in fact, if you combine PV and pumped hydro, compare it to CSP, it's very similar cost. But of course, CSP you do in a desert, pumped hydro you do on hills. There, there'll be a mix, I think. Um, but really, if we if we design our markets properly, I mean, bring it, bring it on. Let everyone have a go. I mean, the you know concept of a flow battery, for example. Well, if you can come up with a very cheap chemical to put in your flow battery, that sounds extremely attractive. So you know, good luck to people who are trying to do that. But bear in mind that the gestation period for new technologies to get to get them up to the gigawatt scale, it takes decades. Um, and the fact is, you know, CSP is one of the things we've got right now, as is pumped hydro. So there's nothing stopping us going in for the transition. If if people bring along better better products over the decades, well, great. It'll just be cheaper. Um, but you know, the right policy is is what we have to get. Yeah, I agree. I mean, like philosophically speaking, I'm not really, you know, like such a capitalist, such a pro pro market person. But <laughs> I, I mean, maybe you've, you've been in renewables longer than I have. But in the 20 ish years that I've been working in the space, you know, so such a difference between when I first got started and, you know, it was a matter of convincing people to spend more on renewables to save the planet. And that went like really went nowhere. Um Compared to now where, you know, in the last 10 years, um, renewables have just become better and it's the same with 
some other energy transition technologies. Um, that's how you move fast, in my opinion. It's, you know, like it mm. might be, it sounds good. Oh, just do it. You know, we don't have time to worry about it. But money motivates yep. people and it motivates no, a lot right. of people. Yeah. Unfortunately, and, and it's actually the case just, that, you know, um, things. you know, we've got a situation in Australia where the coal's all retiring. It's just wearing out, right? So we have to do something. We'd have to replace it with more coal. That's an option, obviously. But all the indications are that the completely renewable system is actually cheaper than replacing mm. the fossil system. So, so it's not it's not really about cost. It's about planning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll end it there today. Um, taking up a little bit more of your time, probably than I said, but pretty close. So yeah, thanks. Thanks heaps. Um, also thanks to WeatherGuard Lightning Tech for sponsoring the live stream. They also have a great tech newsletter and a podcast, which I co-host each week with Alan Hall and Joel Saxon. Um, the links to all that's in the description. So sign up. Um, we talk about all kinds of uh, clean energy technology. And in the latest episode, we talk about predictive maintenance technologies for wind turbines um, and also how the wind turbine blade uh, manufacturing and quality control and repairs kind of works. I talk a bit about the experience that I, I have from working in wind turbine blade factories. Um, so check that out on your favorite podcast app, or you can watch it here on YouTube. Um, also need to thank again, the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team. And if you want to join the team, then there's a link in the description. Of course, the biggest thanks to Keith, who, yeah, really put in a, a lot of a lot of work to help me with the, the main video and get all the um, footage that you've taken from um, your site visits over the years. Um, and yeah, get the proper expert insight. So thanks heaps. Thanks, um, Rosie. That's great. <laughs> and of course, thanks everybody for, for watching. I've got a few um, videos coming out in the future, a few in the pipeline. There's a flow battery, there's lightning and wind turbines there's uh cement um all, all sorts of cool things so yeah stay stay tuned for that and i'll see you in the next video bye okay bye everyone <laughs>